Anyways, welcome to session on the cluster two presentation. The, our theme is uh, interacting AI with reality. This morning, we have two di distinguished uh, uh, guests here, and I'd like to welcome the first presentation from Professor Ivan Laptev. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Great. So thank you very much for the invitation. It's an uh, amazing organization here, I must say. It's uh, all beautiful and uh, so well done, as, as usual in Korea. So I'm not surprised, but I'm surprised uh, because I have not been here for a long time. Uh, so very, very happy to be here. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, uh, language-guided navigation and manipulation and to, uh, to start, the, to motivate the, uh, uh, the talk, I want to start to show uh, one video. Okay, this is a time-lapse video where uh, people are cleaning the room, so kids uh, doing lots of stuff. Uh, so I wish my kids were will be doing the same uh, or would be able to do the same. They usually do the opposite. Like if you play the video reverse order, that's uh, what usually my kids do. Uh, right, and so the uh, okay. So this is a task of cleaning, cleaning the house, uh, which involves uh, many steps. You can describe it by language. So I try to describe it by language to my kids, like how they should clean the room, uh, the house. It doesn't really work. Uh, so I really would like to have a, co a computer or robot, maybe, which will clean your house. Okay, that's one one of the applications that people have been thinking, I guess, for many years. Uh, but this is just one of them. And now, so this is a visual problem because if you put a robot in your house, it's uh, you need, but well, it's a non, it's a structured but uh, some non unknown environment uh, to some extent because you you cannot assume that you uh, model everything in this uh, in this house, right? So so you need to uh, sense the environment, and of course one of the uh, best senses for this is uh, vision. So there's a clear link between computer vision and um, robotics, I guess also, which is a uh, topic of this session. So let's see on this particular video what computer vision can do. So we, we are now uh, 10, uh, 11 years after the uh, uh, deep network revolution. So, so we, have, we know how to detect objects, we know how to detect actions, uh, human poses. So these are not automatic results, but I guess the automatic automatic results could be even better than my hand drawing. Um, right. So so all this is good, but now question: So how does it really bring us for closer to what we want to do? If you just if you want to instruct ro the robot how to clean the room, and um, <clears throat> the answer is probably not so clear, or maybe it's actually the answer is no because. Uh, so if the real question is, what are the actions which are required to go from state on the left to state on the right? And uh, so if we do all the great computer vision machinery, which we can do now, it's uh, not clear how, how it helps us to, uh, to uh, go here, right? And um, so if you want to have a robot which uh, goes from a state on the left to state on the right, what is it really that we wanted to do? Uh, so typically, uh, this problem is can be uh, um, separated into two sub-problems. One is uh, on uh, navigation and one about manipulation, right? So they are actually the same problem because, uh, and often mixed, because when you navigate, you also usually, often you do navigate, like move around and do things at the same time. Uh, but uh, it's useful for just to separate them to make the problem a bit simpler. And uh, so in navigation, often people assume that you don't need to uh, like make much of contact, so the only contact is with the ground, and uh, contacts in general, these are hard to model. Uh, simulating the contacts is hard. So if you just assume that you uh, in navigation, you only uh, model, uh, so you only uh, have contact with the ground, uh, for example, the wheel robot, or even the um, locomotion, so it's a bit easier. Now, for manipulation, you really need to touch the objects and manipulate the object. This is harder, so that's why we uh, 
separate them. And so in this talk, I'm going to uh, discuss a few works which we've done recently, and there are going to be two parts, one on navigation and one on manipulation. And just to keep the time, so how much time actually do I have? Forty minutes. Okay. This with questions, right? Was yeah. Okay, great. Okay, great. So uh, yeah, so there are uh, four papers which I'll try to go through quickly. So uh, the two on navigation and two on manipulation. So let's start with the first one. So the, all this work, most of this work was done with uh, Shiji Chen, who is now a uh, researcher at uh, INRE in the Willow team in Paris and uh, with Cordelia Schmidt and uh, our students, right? So that work was published in NIRIPS. Uh, so what's the, um, uh, oh yeah, maybe what I, important thing which I meant, forgot to mention is that when we try to understand uh, the scene for robotics application, we also, we also want to mix language. We want to also understand language because language is a good um, uh, way to provide um, natural commands to robots, so natural language. So it's, uh, if, you, if you have a robot at home, it would be nice to just do, uh, well, maybe you have a dedicated button that uh, bring me a tea, but then you would have hundreds of buttons, uh, bring me a coffee, bring me a, so you may want to just communicate naturally with language. So language is a part of the story. And uh, so here is a task which has uh, been introduced f quite a few years ago. Uh, vision language navigation, okay, so the, what's the setup? You are putting an agent in a house uh, and uh, the agent observes the environment with a 360 degrees camera. Uh, it may know its GPS location, but then it doesn't know the environment, okay, so it's supposed to uh, explore the house and do the tasks. And uh, the tasks are given by language, for example, here is a description what the robot has to do. So this is a step-by-step -step descriptions, turn left, uh, go straight, uh, right, turn right. So, <clears throat> so the idea is that now the agent is, uh, translates this language into commands or into actions. And the actions here are quite predefined. So the robot can go like turn 30 degrees, left, right, uh, or move forward. So I guess these are more or less all the actions which it can do, quite simple. Uh, so this can also uh, can be all simulated because uh, you have pre-recorded in 3D environments where you have, uh, uh, for example, one, one version of it is that you have uh, Mater, uh, Matterport cameras just placed uh, in different places in the house and then you can jump from one to another. So this is a, a, a playground where you can test uh, the uh, <coughs> navigation skills of robots which are not so far from reality. All right, uh, and so the goal is, yeah, to uh, at each step is to perform command and then, uh, sorry, the action given the sensor input and uh, hopefully arrive to the goal where the robot's supposed to be. Okay, so this is the task. Um, and uh, so this work was about how to model the environment, uh, how to represent an environment, how to reason on top of this environment. And this reasoning, um, obviously, it needs to combine vision uh, images, the images and text, which is provided as instructions. So the output is action commands. Uh, what we also try to do here is to model the history. So remember that the, uh, uh, the house or the uh, is not known in advance, so the robot is exploring the house. But the problem is that if it just goes from A to B and observes the current image, it already forgets. It doesn't know what it has been doing or seeing before. So uh, the point with this work was to uh, also put uh, as input the, all the history of previous observations and actions that the robot has done. And in this work, so we just did it explicitly by putting all the images and all the um, actions into uh, together as into the input of the network together with text and the current observations. And this becomes a transformer. So transformer is a nice framework, uh, not only because it uh, works good and fancy, but uh, also because it can combine many different inputs, right? M many different types of inputs, like such text, 
images and even the sequences of images, which are not really videos, which are just observations. All right, and um, okay, I'm not going to stop too much. So, well, there, is, there are some de practical details how to implement this. So if you want to uh, put the history of images into uh, the network, so it may run into problems with memory, so therefore uh, we are uh, making more efficient sort of hierarchical representation for, uh, for this network to, to, ho to hold all the images. Right, and uh, so by that, so that work was already uh, two years ago. So by that time, so it was, uh, uh, so we tested it on not just one, many different uh, benchmarks, of course, and uh, so it was outperforming um, all uh, state of the art. And uh, so importantly, also there is a, a difference in these benchmarks, seen and unseen environments. Right, so if you so the uh, <coughs> seen setting means that you train and test in the same house. So it, these are different language commands, but they are in the house which the robot has seen before. And this works. These are blue bars, I guess. Uh, no, actually, uh, uh, no. So it's uh, okay. Maybe somewhere else. Um, so usually, unseen works worse than seen, obviously. Um, uh, right, and uh, so uh, yeah. So here the, the comparison shows the um, difference between if you have a recurrent network, like how to model the history. So if you have a recurrent network uh, or hier hierarchical representation, more explicit representation, and uh, here it shows that it works very well. Right, uh, so. This uh, was the HUNT. HUNT actually, uh, now, uh, still now, it's uh, one of the uh, leading methods. It was uh, a winning competition uh, two years ago, and I think many works since then have built on top of this method, uh, including our next uh, work where we uh, made the graph more explicit. So in HUNT, uh, what I just described before, the history was uh, was modeled explicitly, so we just uh, sh uh, presented the image uh, on the way of the uh, uh, of the robot. But uh, so as a, as it is, so the method actually doesn't know about the graph. Okay, so for example, it doesn't know that it has moved uh, forward and then moved backward. It doesn't know that actually it came back to the same place, not explicitly. Right. So with the extension of this work. Uh, here, so we try to model uh, the observations, put the observations in a graph, uh, and um, so that uh, the robot could then take actions, not just move uh, forward or turn, but also to move to some nodes which it has be, which it has seen before already, All right? Uh, so it doesn't know, still doesn't know all the graph until until it goes uh, around all the environment. It doesn't know all the graph, but uh, it will uh, know the graph for the places where it has been before, and so it can uh, jump back. Which is important if it gets stuck, for example, then it can decide. Then okay, I'm not getting anywhere at this point. I can, I should go back somewhere, and it can choose which node in the graph to go back. Right, so as I said, so there were some uh, competition winnings and uh, some results. So here is an example. That's what uh, what is robot seeing. This is 360 degrees view of the environment. This is the first image, and instruction says that uh, it should go um, exit the robot hole, follow the red carpet, turn right. Okay, so red carpet is actually a, not just one direction. It goes in many directions, so it needs to guess which one to go which is uh, even for us humans probably would not be obvious. So it picks one, di one direction, which is uh, here along the hole. And, uh, and then at some point the instruction says turn right. Okay, and there is no way to turn right actually here so because it's, it got stuck. So it does, uh, well, we believe it's a network. We don't know exactly what happens, but we believe it uh, uh, it's uh, understands that okay, it cannot turn right, so therefore it has to backtrack. So it backtracks to the position where it was before, um, and uh, and then gets to the uh, position where it's supposed to be. 
All right. Um, so, uh, any questions? Yeah, feel free to ask any questions if you're on the way. Uh, so then, um, one more extension of uh, this work uh, was about uh, goal navigation, object goal navigation. So this is the task is similar but uh, slightly different. The goal is given not by the set of instructions, uh, what the robot should do. It, it's given just by the object, like chair or um, dining table, and the robot is supposed to explore environment and find this object in the uh, in the environment. Right. So not uh, a trivial goal, uh, not trivial task. So how? Well, you could just apply the same method as before. That's uh, that's a possibility, um, which we've tried. Uh, it works, but uh, here the improvement is that we are trying to model the um, the uh, environment more explicitly in the following sense. Uh, so we are building a representation of the environment on the fly when the uh, while the robot is moving. And uh, this representation contains uh, features, so it's, you see it here, so it's a three by three. It's very coarse, so it, it could be five by five, we try different <coughs> versions. So it's, um, it's, you can think of it as a spatial memory of the environment. Right? So, so the robot starts, so it probably somewhere, uh, yeah, the starting point is probably here, okay, and as it moves around, uh, so it knows the GPS position, so it knows that it may be moved like five meters away. <coughs> uh, so it updates the, um, uh, the spatial map, uh, recurrent map, uh, with the features of the environment that it sees at different locations. Right? And uh, so update is given with a coordinate. So uh, this memory is uh, not just, one could think of it as a uh, just one state memory. So if you keep this cube to one uh, location, this will be a, actually a recurrent network with transformer. It doesn't matter that it's transformer, but this would be a kind of recurrent, uh, uh, typical recurrent network. So we are, we are extending this uh, recurrent network to a spatially aware uh, memory. And, uh, and this gives uh, good results. So it, uh, you see here, so if we have, um, <coughs> uh, so these are some uh, numbers uh, which shows that, uh, yeah, the, this uh, memory with the loca location-aware memory, which is uh, accumulated during the um, go of the robot, is actually very useful. And uh, so here is some video. Uh, first, uh, these are synthetic videos. These are test videos, but this this gives you idea how the robot is trained. So, uh, so these are synthetic. Well, these are real environment actually, which are reconstructed into 3D, and the robot can navigate freely uh, um, in them. Right. So, so here, say the goal is the cabinet or chest of drawer and. Uh, so the robot goes around the house and tries to find. Of course, the metrics, if you're not familiar with the task, the metrics do penalize the length of the path. So one metric is uh, that you succeed or not, right, in a, some given time. Um, but then, of course, uh, it's penalized. Like, if you can just exhaustively go over the house, right, so and eventually, well, if your classifier of the cabinet works, eventually you will stop at the right place. Uh, but then your path might be very long, and the idea is to course, minimize the path. So there's a special metric for this. And uh, so we also implemented it on the real robot in our lab. Uh, so we can just tell it to go to the find the flower or find, uh, uh, find the, um, the sink and uh, goes around the, uh, our office and finds the objects. See here, it's uh, uh, times thirty times ten. So the robot is uh, takes some time to think. So it's uh, not yet applicable, probably, in, uh, to the house, to the home. But uh, 
yeah, at least some work, it's, I guess it will be uh, much faster. All right, any, any other questions to, uh, to these parts? Because I'm going, yes. I'm not sure the format of the action that the navigation agent should predict, or uh, such as uh, the navigation agent should predict low level actions, such as uh, move three meters exactly, forward. Exactly, yes, yes. So here uh, in this navig navigation task, they typically defined, actually there are two versions. There is a discrete and continuous. So in discrete, it's uh, very clear. So you have just points on the ground. Um, and the, uh, the robot can go from one point to another, which, uh, which are, so they are connected, the closest points are connected. So the robot can move 30 degrees mm -hmm. and then go forward. So these are typical actions which uh, it can do. Uh, In a continuous environment, maybe it, uh, it could be defined more continuously that you can maybe move, like rotate 25 or go one meter or, or five centimeters. Um, yeah, so this is the set of actions. So it assumes that the robots can, like, uh, the low-level motion planning is solved. Yeah, it knows how to rotate and how to move forward. Does it means that the you the two works you introduced work in the predefined state? Yeah. So the uh, uh, obviously the uh, second the last one which I've shown, this is continuous environment because uh, especially for real robot here, so it needs to. Uh, navigate in a continuous space. Okay, so here the uh, the actions are also continuous. Okay, thank you. All right, so I'm switching now for the second part, which is about uh, manipulation. So it's uh, um, work with a few postdocs and uh, students here, um, and. Um, all right, so as I mentioned in the beginning, so manipulation is, uh, is a hard problem. Um, so here are a few challenges. So there are, of course, lots and lots of different tasks which we perform in our daily life. Uh, the obs current observations, they don't reveal uh, the physical state of the world, uh, which may, may also depend on the previous action. All right, so you may know this. Uh, uh, this game uh, where people try to trick you to know where the uh, object is under which cup. Okay, so you have to be very careful seeing what's uh, observing the scene in the past and also modeling the previous observations. Otherwise, yeah, you cannot solve this, this task. So the same with the robot. Like if you, for example, if it puts something in the cupboard, so it should remember that which part, where it put the spoon or something so that it can go back and find it again. So it's a precision, precision, there are small objects. There is a, sometimes uh, it has to really, uh, like putting even simple thing, like putting a cup on the table, uh, well, if, especially if it has some liquid, so this is a very precise task because it's very easy to spill. And um, uh, so if the uh, complexity of the scene, this is uh, another big challenge. Uh, so uh, how do we deal with the scenes which are unstructured or we don't know how to model very well? All right, so, uh, and, uh, so what we are trying to do in this work, try to address uh, all of these challenges, it doesn't provide solution to all these challenges, obviously, final solution. But uh, um, so our answer to these uh, challenges is, um, so first, like how do we handle many tasks? Well, you can train a robotics policy for every task and come up with a thousands and thousands of policies. Uh, this may not be a great solution. Uh, so maybe it's better to have just one policy which, uh, 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 but which can take the language's input and language actually defines uh, uh, the task. For example, use broom to brush the dirt into the dustpan. All right, so then, uh, <coughs> uh, so to uh, encode the history observations, so similar to the work which I've des described about nav navigation, so here we model the uh, manipulation history. Okay, we, we store the images and actions of previous states. Uh, to, to handle uh, precision, we do multiple cameras. 
So typically, if you have to have precise ta do precise tasks in 3D, you you want to have multiple cameras. That's uh, Jean knows that the geometry is uh, helping, and uh, and then for um, uh, so we, we're also using RGBD uh, for uh, to get both the depth and the um, the color of the scene for better modeling. And now, so uh, uh, so the, this work is called Highformer. Uh, so it it is goes all into one transformer. And I guess, again, I said before, so transformers are very good to combine different types of uh, diverse types of inputs, such as language and uh, RGB and depth and multiple frames and actually have frames from different cameras. So all these can easily just, since everything is a to tokens nowadays, so you can simply put it into a transformer and uh, and ma make it, uh, it's magic. Okay, so it doesn't, gar it doesn't guarantee that it will work, but uh, we can actually, we, we can experimentally see, and that's what I will show that, uh, Actually, putting multiple cameras, putting multiple, like adding the history, so all this uh, gives positive effect without us doing anything, just putting these different types of inputs together. Right, so a bit of uh, um, details uh, which were important here for this work, for example, modeling language. So we found that, uh, like, okay, you want to, you don't start from scratch nowadays, so you, you try to take some pre trained uh, language model, <coughs> uh, because typically your data which you train, especially in academia, is not large enough, and in robotics especially you don't have large data, uh, so you want to pre-train that work. And what we found that uh, taking language which was just trained for the language task, like BERT, which was trained from news, and some like lots of text, it was actually performing worse uh, than taking uh, some vision language language model which was pre-trained on vision and language task like clip for example you notice that clip knows about colors bird uh, doesn't uh, know very well uh, doesn't distinguish colors very well uh, right so multiple views <coughs> so we take it from current and previous steps uh, and um, uh, so yeah so there is also uh, one, okay, you, you want to encode multiple views into the um, transformers. So the the way how you form the tokens uh, is important. So uh, so here it was uh, important to, to to make tokens which are corresponding to particular position in the image. So one variant could be to take channels as uh, tokens, and this works significantly worse. So probably this means that uh, patch tokens, uh, they know about, uh, they encode spatial information, and which is important. Uh, right, so then uh, some cross-attention was important to combine language and uh, images. Um, so uh, yeah, the self-attention didn't work very well. And finally, so there was a, a behavior cloning loss to train all the system. So we are training it in a supervised way, right? So the uh, benchmark now is uh, different from navigation, obviously. So this one is a, a simulator which has uh, about 100 hand-designed tasks. Uh, so we consider 74 of them because the others didn't work. I mean, they were didn't, yeah. So they they could not be modeled very well. Actually, they didn't work. So these are the ones which are working. And um, yeah, so there are tasks like make the put the lamp on or push the buttons. And there are also variation of the tasks. So for, for actually to, to handle these tasks, the language may not be important because you can just uh, train policies for class one, class two, class three. Uh, but then there is there are variations of the tasks saying that uh, for example, you have to press a sequence of buttons in a particular order, okay? And this order in training and testing can be different. So it's not that, uh, so the network, the method policy has to generalize from uh, um, one uh, set of orders to another at the test time. Okay, so that's more 
interesting. And uh, so let's see at some uh, ablations. Mm. Uh, so first, the uh, uh, so multi-view is uh, really helpful. Uh, so it uh, uh, oh yeah, maybe I should should have mentioned also. So what are the actions? What what are the um, actually the actions which are predicted by the uh, uh, which are which are expected uh, to be predicted? These are uh, commands go to L next location X Y Z in a three D space. Right, and this X, Y, Z, it's not like one millimeter left from the previous location. It's more in a, yeah, in a, like, so maybe tens of centimeters. So these are larger actions. So the full, uh, say, for example, uh, uh, like the, to water the plants. So the uh, action sequence could contain like uh, five, six, seven steps. I think there are all, 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 all the tasks, the average is about six steps. So you, uh, at each moment, the uh, policy should predict where the uh, robot arm should go next, like say maybe from here to here, and then the motion planner, which is a, uh, no network, just classic motion planner, is supposed to execute this motion. So this is the action space. Mm. <coughs> All right, and uh, so, yeah, so if you want to, uh, uh, to be precise, so you, basically what you need, you need to determine what is the next X, Y, Z position in the 3D space. And for these, uh, multiple cameras uh, help a lot. And as I said before, so we just uh, take three different cameras, put them into transformer, and uh, this gives like 5% boost uh, over the baseline. The history, which is modeling the previous observations, gives another 3-4%. Um, and okay, there are some other details. Uh, for example, cross attention versus self attention was uh, uh, cross attention was working much better. So in overall, over the baseline, get about fifteen percent. Um, right. So here is an uh, interesting relation where well, there are a few points here to make. So first, as I mentioned there is a seen unseen. Okay. So seen means. Uh, uh, yeah, so these are variations of the task. So scene means that you learn and test on the same sequences of pushing button. Okay, and the performance is obviously very good. Uh, but then if you try to generalize, if you want to test time, you show a sequence of buttons which were not shown in training time. So the results are a bit worse, but uh, uh, they're still good and they're getting better with uh, more training data. Okay, and okay, the second column is a tower, so it was another uh, task where where uh, the robot's supposed to build a tower of different colors and to do it also in a sequence. All right. Okay, I still have one uh, work to go through. Go, we're going to go do this very briefly. So this is a recent work which was which is going to be presented next week at Coral. Um, and um, so the task is very similar. It's actually the same task as uh, I just described. So the robot is supposed to, given the uh, textual descriptions, the robot is supposed to manipulate. And there are, like here you see different variants. So it, uh, like it says, drag the block towards the lime square on the table. Okay, so it's supposed to use a stick and to push this block here, right? So this would be the correct task. And uh, okay, so these are variations of the same task, which are uh, which can be made different uh, at test time, both in terms of which uh, uh, place it should uh, move the um, the cube, and also the general language descriptions. They also vary, right? And the uh, okay, what's the main uh, idea in this paper? Uh, so we so if starting with high former, which I just described before, so high former had a history, but it also had the 2D or 2.5D observations. So it has RGBD images, and they were processed separately by UNET, uh, and then there was a transformer. So what uh, we thought is missing here is more explicit 3D representation. And uh, so we do have point clouds, so from depth, map, we do have point clouds, so we can actually, we do, we do know if you have camera calibration, we can uh, put them into the 3D world, these point clouds, 
and um, and then since we have multiple cameras, we can just concatenate point clouds from all the cameras, and uh, this becomes a scene representation, right? Uh, what's also important here is that we not just look at point clouds as 3D coordinates, as usually people do, but uh, associate the color. So because in the images, of course, like here, if you take any point, it has depth. So we can reconstruct X, Y, Z, but we also know the color. So we put the color into these points. Uh, so we have um, X, Y, Z, RGB uh, point cloud representation for, for the scene. And let's see uh, how we can use it. So basically, we, we, uh, now the difference that we, we combine, we merge all the uh, uh, observations from three, ca three cameras uh, into a point cloud process it with a point net encoder which is standard then putting a transformer uh, also nowadays standard as before I described which combines text and uh, and uh, the point cloud representation and then the output is uh, another point cloud representation which uh, predicts where the robot should move next okay and this is trained with behavior cloning so, uh, so the main difference that really the representation now, instead of multiple views processed separately, two and a half D, now we have a uh, one representation from all uh, cameras uh, as a three D. Right. So here is the uh, interesting conclusion. So for like adding uh, RGB to the X Y Z coordinates is really useful. So it gives uh, 19%. So I think that's an uh, um, interesting conclusion. So if you work with point clouds for some real tasks, so it's, it's, uh, if you can get uh, color information, so it's very easy to just add RGB value uh, to, uh, to XYZ and you get boost. So we're also now experimenting, maybe not just adding XYZ uh, color information, but it could be also a clip feature, it could be a, many other things, maybe a, a object label. So that's one. So uh, multiple cameras obviously help. So you see here that if you take uh, one camera results are around uh, 40s, with two cameras results are around uh, 70, and with uh, three cameras it's 92. And, and another thing which was uh, helpful is to remove background from the point cloud. We don't think background and um, um, so background and table, right? So they're observed, of course, by the camera. Uh, we don't think they are useless or they, they should hurt, but because of the processing reasons, so we, we have to sample the points on the point cloud. And uh, so if we spend most of resources of uh, uh, sampling points on the table, okay, we will miss most of the important stuff. So just remove this. Okay, state of the art. And uh, I'm almost out of time, so I'm just showing some video. So, okay, this is a trained, so uh, it's a real robot demo. So it's trained in simulation, and then it is fine-tuned on a few real examples on a real robot. And training, pre-training the in simulation is helpful. I don't have results here, but... Uh, Typically, if you train from, so this is really trained. On real robot, you only have like few, like five, 10 examples, and this won't be enough to train. Okay. All right, so this is it. So just a few final words. Uh, so that's what I've been talking about. Uh, navigation and manipulation with language. Uh, so we believe that, uh, uh, there's uh, lots of things still to do uh, where vision is combined with language and uh, with robots. And this uh, uh, circle goes both ways. So I really believe that um, the uh, vision, so obviously vision benefits from language and robotics hopefully uh, will uh, hopefully will convince roboticists that it should benefit from vision and recent methods, but uh, also the other way around. So robotics could really help or in uh, vision. So, so here are just few uh, examples where it shows that uh, 
vision is uh, far from being solved. So, for example, if you uh, want to, well, do we have a system which can uh, understand what's going on in this image uh, or what will happen in that scene? Actually, if you, I've been showing these uh, images for a while uh, nowadays. Uh, when you have such questions, what do you do? You go to chat GPT or GPT-4. V and uh, okay for this image, uh, what it thinks, what the man is trying to do, the man, man is trying to set the table for a special occasion of romantic dinner. Okay, that's one interpretation, uh, which is uh, probably not correct here. Uh, so here is another example from also for GPT-4 V. So so what is, happens if people? In this image, will turn and walk left, so it says that it will be heading towards the bridge across the river. All right. So, so embodied understanding of uh, of the scenes is, uh, I think, far from being solved, uh, and uh, there is a great opportunity to uh, to work on this, which we are trying to do. I'm recently moved to. Uh, uh, MBZ UAI University, which is in Abu Dhabi, which is a new, new university. It has uh, computer vision, machine learning, NLP, and soon robotics departments. And uh, so, yeah, we are hiring. So, if you are interested in postdoc or other positions, thank you so much. Uh, we might have time for one question. Any question from the audience? Uh, thank you for the great talk, Ivan. Uh, I mean, the results looks very uh, impressive, uh, but uh, all the results you have shown to us is about just, uh, you know, some variations in the same task, right? I mean, have you ever checked this cross-task generalization performance in the experiment? Not yet. I uh, think, uh, yeah, I guess the uh, bottleneck is uh, hmm. just handling the experiments uh, because all real robot experiments takes time, even simulation takes time. Uh, the building benchmarks, which we didn't do actually, so RL bench is uh, from uh, uh, I think Imperial or yeah, the, yeah. So we we didn't do the benchmarks. So I think this all this is coming. It just takes time to to do. But this is exactly uh, where we want to go, of course. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Professor uh, Laptop. Thank you again. Thank you. Okay. Let's move on to the second speaker. Uh, our second speaker is Professor Min Soo Jo from Postech. Uh, he will be presenting with the title of Relational Inference for 3D Shapes Orientation, Correspondence and Assembly. Uh, please welcome Professor Jo. Okay. Uh, I will introduce my recent work on Relational Inference for 3D Shapes. Uh, what do I mean by Relational Inference? Uh, yeah, let's get a 3D object, a chair, and another two objects, like in this case, uh, a chair, another chair, and one ship, like this. So uh, we can imagine many kinds of relations across them. So uh, first of all, to better see the relations, we may need some alignment across the object, like this. So that's what I call conicalization, uh, which can be done by estimating uh, some characteristic orientations of each object and then align them to the same directions. Okay, now it looks like better and easy to compare them. So the most basic relationship would be a correspondence relations across objects. So we want to figure out which objects are corresponding or not, as you can see here. Uh, and what are the uh, detailed correspondences? And another task would be uh, somehow mating a task. So two chairs can be grouped together in the sense that uh, they are the same category, for example. Yeah, uh, and a chair and a table can be a good mate to each other uh, in another sense that they are used as a pair in many uh, places. And one of the most interesting relationship problem would be to assemble an object from each part. So all of these problems require fine-grained shape analysis and comparison. So that's what I call relational inference. So I will 
uh, talk about some manipulations as Ivan uh, presented before. But in my case, there is no manipulator. Uh, so we just uh, work on manipulating in a virtual environment without manipulator. So I prepared the three content, but I will focus on the first because of the lack of time. And I will just briefly show some results about the, the other two tasks. So uh, the first part is uh, our recent work presented in ICML 2023. Um, that's about yeah, characteristic orientation, uh, canonicalization. So uh, to compare object instances, we may need to put them in the same direction. right? And it can be used for many other tasks, like a classification and segmentation and others. So because in our three-dimensional reality, object may appear oriented to an arbitrary direction. So uh, canonicalizing an object orientation can be done by yeah, assigning a characteristic orientation or pose to each object. So basically, we want to assign such a characteris characteristic orientation to the object without any supervision. So uh, the common desiderata uh, used for characteristic orientation is as follows. The first one is uh, the stability, uh, meaning that the same point cloud with an arbitrary orientation should have the same canonical orientation. Yeah, maybe it is obvious. So some of you may notice that this stability criterion exactly corresponds to the property of rotational uh, equivariance, accessory equivariance. Uh, Meaning that uh, you know the output of our orientation estimator should be consistent over arbitrary orientation, being commutative with respect to orientation. So the you know in other words the result of the rotating the input should be the same as the output of the rotated input. So that's what I mean by uh, orientation equivariance. So that is actually exactly corresponds to the stability criterion used in this characteristic orientation estimation. And the second one is what we call consistency in the literature, meaning that the point clouds of the same category uh, should recover the same canonical orientation, which is actually cross-instance stability. Uh, but the learning to assign this characteristic orientation uh, satisfying both of the stability and consistency is non-trivial. So previous methods uh, focuses a uh, focus on the stability only uh, by learning to reconstruct the point clouds in a self-supervised manner. Uh, so, uh, but they commonly fail to achieve good level of consistency across instance generalization. So, uh, that motivated our work. So, our method called choir achieves both of the stability and the consistency together. Uh, here in this slide, uh, the point cloud P is involved with a random rotation denoted by R. So actually that is input. And we want to assign a sta stable and consistent orientation by function F, uh, which is our method. So, uh, Actually, our method facilitates the multi-class training by eschewing the point cloud reconstruction. And it uh, is doing that based on invariant residual learning for stable and consistent prediction, which will be detailed in the later slide. OK, here is the overview illustration of our method, uh, consisting of uh, rotation equivalent uh, predictor, hyp uh, orientation hypothesizer, H, and uh, accessory invariant residual uh, predictor. Let's take one by one. Uh, first, uh, by adopting accessory equivariant, you know, rotation equivariant network H, we uh, predict an orientation uh, hypothesis, initial you know, uh, orientation hypothesis. Uh, as you can see in this uh, figure, so uh, the, for all the module used in this 
mod in, in this network are from you know rotation uh, equivalent uh, neural network uh, you know proposed by uh, doing at L as you can see the you know reference at the bottom of the slide here and using this uh, orientation uh, hypothesizer H uh, we produce two output uh, the initially a canonicalized point cloud uh, used, you know, in the upper stream over there, and the uh, invariant feature by collapsing the orientation factor, uh, which is done by uh, gram schmidt process. You can see that in the, you know, lower stream here. Uh, at this point, I want to emphasize that uh, we can guarantee the SO3 equivariance in the first output by design because that is, you know, equivalent network. Uh, in other words, the same point cloud should be assigned the same orientation, uh, fully satisfying the stability. So now the remaining issue uh, is that uh, we have to satisfy consistency altogether, right? Uh, which is cross instance uh, orientation gap. So we additionally predict this residue uh, cross instance gap using the uh, extracted SO3 invariant feature. So here is the additional function. So residual predictor G, uh, this is designed to fill the gap of a cross instance difference. And so the output of G is used to further rotate the initially canonicalized point cloud. Uh, since this is, you know, SO3 invariant feature, the final output does not break the SO3 uh, equivariance. Uh, to sum up, uh, this design maintains uh, SO3 equivariance and without SO3 invariant residue, uh, with SO3 invariant residue, we can achieve the both a stable and consistent characteristic orientation. Uh, maybe some of you may have noticed uh, you know, some resemblance to very classic work. Uh, I mean, that is actually a uh, reminiscence of a classical pipeline of feature, extract feature extractor in computer vision. So, uh, you know, for example, SIFT. Uh, at that time, we used the term covariance instead of uh, equivariance. But uh, if you uh, take a look at this pipeline structure, so it is quite similar to what we have used in SIFT. Yeah. John? Yeah. yeah. Yes, uh, Zhang said, I mean, those two terms are exactly the same, but uh, different terminology, I mean, different uh, names. Yeah, it's true. Uh, by the way, somehow this pipeline is an end to end trainable neural version of maybe a sift like uh, predictor. So, okay, by the way, uh, I want to show you some uh, learning process, uh, how to train it without supervision. Uh, let me see, yeah. Uh, during training, we have two point clouds, P1 and P2 randomly rotated by R1, R2, respectively. So then it goes uh, through, uh, you know, our network uh, and produce respective output, which is two characteristic orientations. So the loss function has this form. Uh, so basically the difference between the product of the output and the product of the random rotations. Uh, because our network is SO3 uh, equivariant, so a simple derivation gives us that uh, we can cancel out all the rotation factors in this uh, formulation. So then, uh, uh, okay, uh, by basically the interpretation just goes like this. So when we have the same uh, point clouds, P1, P2, it's the case of training with the same instance, uh, so which learns the stability, right? And when we have the different P1 and P2, 
it's the case of cross instance training, learning the consistency. So with the same loss, uh, without you know any supervision, we can train this network end to end. So that's the main point. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, this is the comparison on the shape net. So uh, basically, our method uh, improves overall state of the art, uh, except for a consistency uh, measure in a particular class, which is table. Uh, yeah, uh, if you look at the you know the rightmost the column, so basically there is a one, yeah, number. Uh, actually, uh, that's because of uh, uh, symmetry issue. So what we uh, found is that the first symmet symmetric object, so orientation assignment, uh, this problem can be imposed. So maybe you can imagine, you know, what happens when we have this, you know, fully symmetric object. Uh, so this is quite uh, challenging and interesting issue. So we leave it to the future work. Uh, yeah. By the way, the the point, point transform at the bottom is a baseline trained for uh, consistency only. So it gives us like good uh, numbers uh, in terms of consistency, but uh, it completely fails in terms of stability. So that is uh, what happens in usual uh, network. And here is a qualitative example. Uh, you can see our method can equalize all these uh, randomly rotated inputs uh, in a precise way, uh, yeah. And uh, what we have done is we apply this canonicalization method uh, for other tasks like uh, you know segmentation, part segmentation in this case. So uh, as you can see from this table, the canonicalization actually helps to improve uh, this off-the-shelf non-equivariant methods uh, in this task. So part segmentation. So here you see, and here is a qualitative example. You see, uh, yeah, DGCNN is you know this non-equivalent network for part uh, segmentation. Uh, so when we apply our method without applying this uh, off-the-shelf method, and then the result is it's much better. This is the summary. Uh, do you have any question about the first part of my talk? Okay, then I will move on. Uh, yeah, it's already okay. Eleven. So, uh, yeah. In the following, I'll just briefly go over my list work under review. The first one is uh, the work for the semantic correspondence across the three D shapes. So this is the task, what I really like. Uh, I mean, this is a 3D version. Uh, 3D dense semantic correspondence, this task can be defined in this way. So uh, across different instances of, from the same category, you want to establish dense correspondence between them. Uh, previous approaches uh, tackled this, this issue in a self-supervised manner, which is good. But the problem was they all uh, uh, assumed aligned shape in training. So this actually uh, greatly limits the applications because of heavy annotation cost, so as you can expect. So what we want to do is, so you want it to make it like uh, SO3 uh, equivariant uh, in training. So the main idea uh, used in this method is very similar to what I have presented before in the earlier part, but a bit kind of improved version. So the architecture has a form of encoder-decoder for reconstruction. So both, of, both the encoder and the decoder are SO3 uh, equivalent networks. So uh, basically, we predict SO3 invariant point-wise features, uh, you know, on the top, as you can see. And at the same time, SO3 uh, equivalent global feature 
in the lower part there, denoted by Z, and combine them to produce features with stability and consistency uh, as we have seen before in the earlier part of my talk. Yeah, uh, so the loss function is a bit complicated. Uh, by the way, I mean, this is doing some uh, self reconstruction and cross reconstruction using uh, some, you know, uh, distance measures. Uh, yeah, I will just skip that. I mean, the whole network is trained end to end without any supervision, uh, you know, because so we all know this. Uh, uh, you know, information used in training time. So after establishing dense correspondence after training, so you can just apply this uh, network to uh, any, you know, unseen data. And you can use the result to somehow transfer labels, uh, you know, in, for example, in this case, key point transfer so the shape A, so you have some annotations. Uh, by establishing dense correspondences between uh, this one and another one, you want to transfer the labels. So uh, this is comparison to the state of the art method uh, named P CPAE. So you can see uh, our method is showing much better uh, transport result uh, in these examples. And this is the quantitative uh, result, the precision equal curve, uh, yeah, uh, across different classes. Okay, this is the result on, yep, now shame that part they are set. Other message is the same. So uh, our method outperforms the previous state of the art without rotation augmentation. Uh, in training. So basically, uh, to adapt uh, non-equivalent method in some random rotation in testing time, so the conventional way of training is to just add random rotation augmentation in training time, right? So we, can, we actually com uh, compared our method with uh, that kind of scheme and showing that our method is better. And this is the Label transfer result in a specific uh, example. So yeah, our method is very close to GT. Okay. And uh, finally, I want to show you my recent work on uh, geometric shape assembly. Uh, geometric shape assembly is yeah uh, expressed here. So you want to, uh, you know, assemble just a target object based on just a, a given part of the object. So this requires fine-grained uh, alignment between different fragments, also uh, some robustness to random arbitrary orientation and translation. So uh, this task draws much attention these days. So there are some recently published two benchmarks about this task. Uh, the first one is fantastic break, and the second one is breaking bad data set. So we uh, uh, wanted to apply our uh, 3D point cloud matching method uh, to solve this assembly problem. Uh, actually, uh, the most effective method, which is turns out to be in many papers, is, high is to use high dimensional feature transform. Uh, but actually, uh, applying this method to a three-dimensional three point cloud space is quite costly. So uh, in practice, it was not uh, uh, feasible uh, to uh, real realistic problems of 3D point cloud matching because of this computation cost. So what we have done in this work is to make some approximation method uh, to this uh, high dimensional feature transform. 
So uh, we build on the state-of-the-art point cloud registration architecture named GeoTransformer and uh, replace the main matching modules with our approximate high order feature transform uh, technique. Uh, it enables the network more effective and efficient together. So this is the uh, pairwise shape assembly result compared with other state-of-the-art uh, method on this task. So we can see that uh, you know this visual comparison of the result. Yep. So our method denoted by yeah, I mean just hours there <laughs> is showing you know uh, good result. And this is the numbers on the breaking bed data set. So you can see it achieves also state of the art. Now I want to show you some qualitative examples here because okay, lack of time. Okay, we show you this one. So this is the uh, you know the step by step result on multi part assembly uh, compared to the state of the art method uh, DGL. Uh, you can see. Uh, you know, combine one by one, basically it uh, results in a very good uh, target shape at the end. Uh, so, yeah, this is actually more detailed step-by-step -step comparison, you can see. Yep. Uh, Oh, yeah, I will just conclude. So uh, to, to sum up, I want to deliver you know, three messages. The first one is relational inference for 3D shape is uh, very fundamental to uh, interacting AI with reality. This is the title of this session. Uh, there, there could be many problems like clinicalization, correspondence, and mating, and scene graph, and assembly, and etc. Uh, and I want to emphasize that the leveraging geometric covariance and invariance in a careful design is, is very important for addressing the task in a realistic environment. And uh, uh, another message is developing scalable high order feature transform um, as well as effective representation would be very much necessary for the relational 3D uh, problems. So uh, yeah, this is the end of my presentation. Yeah, thank you for the attention. Uh, any questions from the audience? Uh, we, we might have one. Time. <laughs> Thanks, Minsu, for the great mm. talk. Uh, wondering, I guess it's in the first part, but probably also in a later part. So you are training a regression law, uh, you're regressing to one particular orientation or? Oh, uh, uh, yes, actually, yeah, sure. So when you... Okay, Just wonder well. if it would be interesting all to regress to distribution of orientations because sometimes probably it's not obvious. Right, I mean, that's good, great idea. I mean, maybe you are talking about somehow distribution over all the continuous space of orientation, right? Yeah, that would be one way to go. But uh, uh, in in terms of implementation, I mean, there might be some challenge. But uh, yeah, that's quite a good idea, I think. But uh, we never tried. Thank you. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, maybe to add a little bit. So maybe that approach could be one solution for ambiguity issue. For example, symmetric object, right? Then uh, it could give us like a multiple solutions. So without just collapsing to just one solution, which might be wrong. Okay, thank you. <coughs> okay, so we like, I would like to end this session. Uh, please thank, let, let us thank Professor Joe one more time. So after this program, there is a keynote presentation on the third floor, not here. Okay, great room. And those, who, those of you who are on YouTube, you need to change channels to the uh, other session. Okay? Thank you. Two sessions, uh, interacting with the, interacting AI with the reality. Uh, we, we will have uh, two talks today. Um, our first uh, speaker will be 
Professor Dinggang Chen from the uh, Shanghai Technical University. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, you should be able to hear, right? Uh, so the title for my talk actually is Full Stake, Full Spectrum uh, AI in Medical Imaging. Uh, from these slides, we can see uh, actually, like uh, Dr. Mueller just mentioned, uh, intelligent medicine. There is uh, a lot of applications and also you know, in the uh, big market. So you can see where the uh, North America, Europe, Asia, and Africa. Uh, so there's large market over there. So in this way, China, US, and Europe uh, uh, basically provide uh, AI initiatives or development plans, particularly in the uh, healthcare. So in this way, we can see in our academic area, actually we work in uh, medical, medical image computing, computer at intervention. So this is uh, one of our uh, society. Uh, you can see from 2019 or even later, the submission for the papers almost double compared to you know, 2000. 18 or before. Uh, for 2019, I was a general chair for Mika. Uh, so you can see, you know, there's a large number of submissions for Mika. That also means, you know, uh, a lot of people work in this area. But also, you know, we can see in the right, uh, we have the survey like 2022 asking uh, about uh, 2,000 uh, uh, physicians ask them to later uh, all the AI applications in radiology, surgery, or dermatology. For each one, give score like one to five. Five is the best. So the average score is less than three. That means you know even in the academic area, we develop many many methods, but in the in the clinical areas, people did not appreciate what we did. So you can see large actually gap between the research we are doing and the clinical workflow. So as I mentioned in our field, medical image computing uh, is starting like this conference is starting from 1998. And this is all the keywords in the different time you know, period. So you can see we work on cementation image illustration here, cementation here, cementation here. You know, all this is always a problem you know, for 25 years. And each case, we just focus on one point of the problem, not try to solve the whole problem. It's very important. You have to solve the whole problem, like you know, full stake problem. Means you know, if you do the cementation, input cementation performance like three or five percentage, is it useful for the final clinical application or not? It's not necessary. So, and I will show you some results. So I think you know, for doing research, we have to think about uh, you know, the whole picture, full stack in mind. Second, when we develop AI technique, for example, give an X-ray image, you want to identify one kind of disease. But for physicians, you have to identify all the diseases in one X-ray, you know, just X-ray, maybe 20 or 30 you know, different kind of disease. And also, you know, when you're doing the diagnosis for disease, you, you are using not only CT image, maybe you, you also have to use the MI image. It depends on you know, the difficulty of the tumors you are diagnosing. So in this case, it's very important uh, you know, to concern the full spectrum, like one scan for multi-disease diagnosis, or you know, one disease, you have to use multimodality. So, to do this, actually, uh, Dr. Mueller, uh, uh, the keynote speech just uh, you know, said, uh, although it's very important. Uh, also, from my experience, uh, I work uh, for many years in university and I still work in university. But I know I also work in a uh, uh, company. I co found a company. So I think it's very important to do very close collaboration between uh, you know, all the problems will be from the hospital. So collaboration between the hospital, university, or the company is very important. And although all the issues will be 
list, or you know, asked by physicians, then we formulate a scientific problem to be solved. Then some good solutions will be implemented by company. Then this kind of method will be used in the hospital. But if you know, you know. All the previous, you know, all the initial methods maybe not work very well. Then, you know, you will uh, have the new solutions for the for the uh, previous problem, like this kind of circle you have to do for maybe a couple of times. Then you can actually make up a, a, a product work. So. Uh, I just mentioned that we have to concern the full stack uh, means you have to concern the, all the stages in the diagnosis, like imaging, screening, follow-up, uh, diagnosis, and the therapy. Also, you have to concern the, all this imaging modality I call the full spectrum. And uh, you know the problem we are doing, like using CT for screening, just uh, one point in this coordinate system, like one point. You know most people study for that, but it's very important uh, to link all these points uh, to be aligned, like you are concerned the disease workflow. So if you can uh, join a lot of lines, then a lot of the problems you know, in, in the clinical uh, applications could be solved. But there are so many problems, you, know, you cannot uh, develop one AI one by one. So in this case, it's very important for you to identify or to, to do the technique with, with a common technique. You want to develop one technique to solve you know, the issues, for example, in the imaging, like image reconstruction. You can do the faster MI image reconstruction, low dose CT or low dose PET using one technique. I will show you uh, the examples later. So this basically try to show you, uh, for example, you have a magic uh, you know, cubicle, and in each phase, you have different kind of you know, technique detecting semitation. You can put uh, some you know, component technique together. You can immediately you know, implement uh, one application for the you know, clinical uh, use. So this is just to show you. Uh, so in the next, I will talk about uh, the two concepts, uh, three concepts I mentioned. The first, the full, full stack, uh, second, the full spectrum, and the last, uh, like uh, uh, common technical development. So first, uh, let's talk about uh, uh, full stack, uh, means you, know, you, you want to join a line over there, and I will give you one example, so particular for the lung cancer diagnosis. And uh, here, basically, you know, I will, uh, you know, we, we focus mo mostly like on images. But actually, for the lung cancer uh, management, we have to do like a full stack management. For example, you develop, uh, you know, two like this kind of app, uh, then ask a lot of questions, even use it for some large language model. You know, then you can get high risk patient, ask high risk patients to do health checking in the health center or going to the hospital using CT. Maybe this CT, you know, with uh, with the AI incorporated, and also, you know. When, when the image acquired, you have other AI technique to do the lung nodule uh, detection or for all the disease diagnosis for the lung cancer. And you, you can even make a, a health report for the subject. If you identify a subject with, uh, with a lung cancer, then you want to see whether this lung nodule is benign or malignant or which type of the, uh, uh, lung, lung, lung nodule. If unfortunately this subject with a lung tumor, you have to do one of the choices to do the therapy, for example, radiation therapy. To do that, or even for the surgery, you have to do the preoperative uh, planning, and then during the uh, surgery or, uh, or, or the uh, radiation therapy, you have to transform all the preoperative planning to the intraoperative space. This is more like you know the technique we are doing for the like image registration. And then, if you you finish the therapy, then the next app uh, basically for the patient follow up or even make appointment for the for the patient. So here, you know, I uh, in this talk I will mainly talk about. Uh, uh, this part, so it's all related to the imaging. For example, image, imaging, screening, follow-up, diagnosis, and uh, therapy. So I put uh, all these steps in the bottom left bottom here. I will show you how the AI uh, you know, can be applied. Uh, firstly, for example, for the image, uh, imaging part, uh, we want to do the low-dose CT reconstruction. You use a deep learning algorithm. For example, if we, with a long with a low dose, 
you, you will see the nodule may be not very clear, but you want to use the deep learning algorithm to uh, do the AI reconstruction, so nodule can be also very, very clear. So, uh, of course, you know, this is a technique uh, we got FDA approved in 2020, and uh, we can reduce the dose like uh, 30, 30 to 70 percentage. And also, you, if you ask a physician to lead based on this CT or based on this CT, actually, you know, the uh, improvement of diagnosis can be like 8 to 15 percentage. There's many, many techniques, you know, in the deep learning line now you can use, like a transformer or other technique. So if you acquire this uh, low-dose CT image, reconstructed with the AI I mentioned, so next step is to do the screening. So screening, as I mentioned, the first, for example, uh, with uh, these CT images, uh, you develop a technique uh, like a deep learning, try to localize the long nodule and also segment a long nodule or do diagnosis for the segment long nodule like GGO, solid, subsolid, or classifications. But you know, uh, this is like a, a black box, means the image, solid image in, then you know, the result out. So this is like no any, for example, uh, clinical knowledge you are incorporated in, into this deep learning algorithm. So here, basically, uh, we added two additional uh, tasks. We know these long nodules may develop on the airway or along the airway. So that means, you know, this airway labeling or segmentation can give a very good guidance for localized lung nodule or segment lung nodule. Secondly, in the different part of the lung, like five lobe 18 segments, development of this lung nodule, like probability, is different. So with this, all this kind of information, the image, you can do all this kind of segmentation, this is like two additional tasks with the original three tasks, all five tasks together, then you can do a very good job for long nodule detections. So this uh, 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 method, actually, we already implemented, and also we got like a Chinese FDA approved in 2021, and it's already used in over 800 hospitals every day, uh, so for 50,000 uh, patients. So, so basically, this is already widely used you know, in, in, in China, and uh, young radiologists, young they cannot live without this kind of you know, app for helping them to do the long nodule diagnosis. So with, uh, with the high CT resolutions and also very sensitive uh, long nodule detections, actually a lot of people detect with a long nodule. Then the most important thing is like to do the follow-up Sabiat, you know, Sabiat, you know, physician will ask uh, Sabiat or, or patients to do the follow-up. Means every one year come back, then do the CT scan, then compare current CT with the previous CT. But remember, you know, if you want to visually to do the comparison, it's, you know, even with a 5 or 10 percent of change, you cannot identify. So it's important, you know, the method like we, we are developing called the image registration. You know, in the field, we, many people work on the image registration, uh, particularly longitudinal image registration. You can align the image acquired this time with the image acquired one year ago. So for doing registration, also very important, you know, previously people input two images to try to align them together. But right now, Remember, with the AI, we can segment along very well, and also we can segment the airway, as I mentioned, okay? So we have to do anatomical alignment, because you already segment all the structures. When you do the registration, you should align the corresponding st uh, structure together. And also, you know, for the long nodules, you, you need to align them, because you already segment out uh, the long nodule in current time and the previous time. So in this way, you can adjust them very well. But remember, long nodule is small compared to you know, the whole long volume. So that means the alignment for the small area not necessarily very accurate compared to you know, big area here. So here we use a checking you know, procedure. It means you know, based on this kind of uh, global alignment, you focus on long nodule, you basically matching their position and matching their uh, morphology then you can do very good follow-up, means the longitudinal you know, imaging navigation and the communication we call the U-Link system. 
So this is already used in over 600 hospital. Every month, 1.5 million people use this for the follow-up study. So with uh, long not identified, and if you come back for the follow-up subject with uh, some subject, if you found it's a malignant tumor, and one way to do is for doing the radiation therapy. For doing the radiation therapy, you have the CT image, you want to segment the tumor, and also the surrounding all the structures here. But you know, previously, like, uh, uh, we have to do manually or semi-automatically. But right now with the AI, actually you can do all automatically. Uh, in, the, in the work I will mention later, actually we have one paper published in, in the Nature Communications for a segment of over 160 uh, uh, organs and the target. For each one, we, we just take a 0.7 second and the dice ratio is in average 97 percentage. And all this you know, method is already installed in the TPS, treatment planning system, I will talk about in the next slides. So in this slide, there's two parts. We can focus on the left part first. So for the radiation therapy, there's a totally one, two, three, four, four parts. First part, doing CT scan. Second, based on the scan CT, you do the automatic organ and target segmentation. Then in the third step, based on the segment organ and target, do the planning. Then the last step, actually do the treatment. So all these four steps, and we can take a look at this four step in the animation here. So firstly, basically, a subject going over there, do the CT scan, you have the, all the you know, 2D slides uh, shoot one by one from 3D. Then the second step, do the automatic organ and the target segmentation. Then in the third step here, you do the, you know, the, uh, the, the, the radiation therapy planning. Then in the final step, do the treatment. So the treatment, you can see this guy will move. You put the beam, try to you know, kill the cells you know, in, the, in the body. So this is uh, all the four steps. With this kind of technique, it's very important. You see, subject come to the hospital and lie down in the radiation therapy, CT scanner and the radiation therapy actually integrated. Means you, know, you can do immediate first radiation therapy or first treatment. So for the lung cancer, as I mentioned, it take only 10 minutes and 45 seconds, including automatic controlling, automatic planning, and the refinement if needed, you know, for the, from the physician, but most cases you don't need it. And then you do the treatment. This is just for the lung cancer. And for the other examples, we can see, for example, for the lactal cancer treatment. For the first treatment, for the conventional method, like I mentioned, you, you subject come, take a CT, subject go back home, then the physician do the manual or semi-automatic labeling, uh, labeling, and then do the radiation uh, therapy planning. Then subject come back to the hospital to do the first treatment. It takes 23 days, including waiting time. But right now, subject come, you can do immediately for the first treatment, 23 minutes. So, and also this is uh, true for other applications like uh, breast cancer originally, including the waiting time, 30 days, right now 18 minutes, you can, you can finish the first treatment. So this is uh, like the technique you develop if you know, work very well with, uh, with, uh, with a developer, like a product developer, actually you can make a very difference uh, for the patient and also for the uh, physicians. So I just mentioned for the full spectrum, a full stack, and the line now I'm talking about the full spectrum. So full spectrum, actually, uh, we put a line over there, uh, and what we need, we want to develop uh, like a common technique for example here, like imaging. And he here I just give you, uh, for example, for the fast, uh, you know, uh, CT, MR image acquisition, low dose CT, we, uh, we already mentioned, I'm going to talk about uh, low dose or fast uh, PET image acquisition. But you know, all these uh, three image uh, acquisitions, they are very similar, okay? We can take a look here. This is the image acquisition space for the MR image. This is the case space, right? Uh, of course, with the uh, with sparse sampling, uh, uh, the recontrol image, if using uh, the, the regular method would be not good. But then, 
our goal is to use the image to image like a deep learning based algorithm for information in the in the acquisition space will be improved. You can see they, they will improve, okay? Will improve. And although the images in the image space also will be improved, but we are going to use the same technique to finish like a fast image acquisition, low dose pattern image acquisition. So first I gave you one example for the fast image acquisition, MI image acquisition. As you know, you know, MI take a long time. So we want to combine AI with the complex sensor, what we call the AI assistant complex sensor. So it's ACS technique. Uh, of course, you know, uh, uh, we have to firstly, you know, understand that using AI, like mostly decoding, encoding, you know, low quality image with encoding, you have all the essential information, then you decode it to become high quality image. So this is image to image mapping or data driving method. You could introduce some artifact so we want to integrate this method with uh, uh, medical physics, like you respect a physical property you, where the coil are put the, you know, along the brain. And also more importantly, you want to provide a very good, uh, fast initialization to complex sensor. Complex sensor is very time consuming to do the optimizations. So let's talk about uh, very briefly for the uh, complex sensor. Complex sensor means you know, the data is very sparse. If you cut uh, one part of the cubicle here, you can find a similar one in the other part of the brain, brain image. So that means you know, the data is very, very sparse. But if we just using complex sensor, it's very time consuming to solve you know, optimization problem. But right now, AI can provide uh, good initialization to the complex sensor uh, algorithm. Just repeat this for one time or at most two times, you can do a very good job. So this method is training on over two million training samples, uh, basically try to do from the whole body to head, uh, like spine, abdomen, pelvis, uh, knee, spine, and also ankle. And, and uh, uh, we can see directly see uh, f uh, this paper. Actually, we have the paper already published in this year, cell, uh, cell medical report. Uh, but you know, the result, as you can see here, for scan the multimolarity MI images for the brain, 99 seconds. And this is, uh, is similar for the other part of the human body. And this technique is already, we got FDA approved in 2020. And the technique is already installed in over a hundred solitary mask and used in the, in the hospital. So I just talk about uh, fast image acquisition. We can do the four times faster compared to the original MI image acquisition. And we can also do the low dose pattern recontractions. For example, uh, here, the technique or you know, the outline is, is similar as the, uh, uh, what I just mentioned for the fast MI image acquisition. For example, you know, for the pet image using the physical property, uh, pet physical pro property, and then using basic distribution of, of the phantom, you can get this kind of 3D pet images. But image could be uh, noise or with artifact. Then using AI technique, yeah, as I mentioned, you can input the low quality pet image to be high quality or similar to the, you know, standard those uh, pet image. So the technique is a, uh, it's the same technique as you, what you can see from the, uh, 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 the method we used for the fast MI image acquisition. So this is a whole body pattern image. Uh, using regular method, you have to take uh, 15 minutes, but I will want to improve like, uh, the speed uh, 10 times like less, for example, 1.5 minutes. But the image quality, will, if you compare corresponding with there's a lot of noise artifact over there. Then we use a deep learning algorithm called the Hyper Deep Learning Reconstruction, DLR. And the quality will be very, very similar. Of course, this is a visually, we're still using 1.5 minutes, okay? But uh, uh, we have other quantitative study, like I mentioned, the, the recent uh, paper in Cell Medical Report. So uh, this technique also we got FDA approved in 2020, and it's already installed in in, in the PET CT scanner and used in over 250 uh, scanners in the world. It's not, not only in US, uh, in China, and also sell to US and also Europe, also Japan. 
I, I think also maybe one in, in, in Korea already. So this is a unique, uh, uh, like a whole body, a total body, you know, PET CT. It's totally like a two meter length, okay? And uh, you can, because you have like over 10,000 uh, like uh, detect and receiver. So that means speed is very fast, 40 times faster compared to the PET CT used in the hospital. And also dose is 40 times less. When you inject, uh, you know, the drug, you can see how the drug, uh, you know, moved from, you know, the bo uh, human body because it uh, can acquire uh, the fat image very, very fast. So, so this technique is already, so this scanner is widely used in China and also in the US, US import like three or four this kind of whole body, uh, we call total body PET scanner uh, to, to US. So I mentioned the full stack and also full spectrum um, method as I, as I mentioned. And also, you know, uh, line I'm going to talk about the component. I mentioned I'm going to talk about the three uh, concept. So this is very important. When we develop one technique, for example, you have a segmentation. We call it segmentation engine. This segmentation algorithm or engine is not only used for screening, also can be used for follow-up, diagnosis, and therapy. So this is why I put this kind of big block over there. And it is used not only for MI image, it can use for PET and also for PET CT. Means we want to develop a universal segmentation engine. It can be used for the different stage in the disease diagnosis and also different modality. I'll show you example here. So this is a actual paper we published last year in Nature Communications. We can segment over 160 organ and targets. And as I mentioned before, so that ratio is over 97% uh, accuracy. So this is like a whole body, you know, from the brain, you know, to, 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 to the lip, so all the whole body. This is for the CT image, you know, segmentation. Actually, this same technique can be also extended uh, to the other modality. For example, for segment breast in X-ray, lip, and all the bone in the X-ray images. Same te technique can be also applied to the MI image for brains. You can automatically segment uh, like 116 legion inches or 200 legion inches from the brain. It takes only two seconds to do that, okay, using AI uh, trained. And also, you know, same technique, you can segment this kind of structure from the PET images. So that means one technique you can use for X-ray, MI image, and the PET images. So here, just like I mentioned, you know, because you have, you have all the components. If you can combine the component, you can do the new meaning, you know, uh, detection. And also you can, you know, combine different kind of technique together, you can do the brain metastasis. I will show you uh, some example. I just show you one example uh, for brain metastasis. There's many, many applications we can develop very quickly, you know, for the AI applications. So here, I just want to show you brain metastasis. Actually, we combine the AI component for them detection, segmentation, alignment, algorithm, compound together. Then Within one month, we can make this kind of product. This is a particular for the cancer, as Dr. Mueller just mentioned. Somebody with a cancer in the head and neck, then found you know, the uh, cancer in lung. You know, he, gave, he gave one example. But here, in the reverse way, actually, these this, you know, tumors come from lung. You know, original in the lung, then transformed to the head. But you can see the, like this kind of bubble here, that is, uh, you know, the, the lung, lung cancers in the brain. But, you know, physicians have to, like, going through slice by slice to identify the number of this kind of bubble and also the size. It's time consuming and also, you know. So we develop uh, this kind of algorithm. Of course, you, you know, collaborating with the hospital, like uh, uh, 10,000 images, subjects, you know, uh, some for training, some for validation, some for testing. So this is uh, the algorithm or, or app we develop. This app is already used in the multiple ho top uh, cancer hospitals in China. But of course, before doing that, it's very important for all the medical you know, related work. You have to do the clinical trial. 
means where this method is really help you know physicians. So we have like 300 you know this kind of images from the three center. Ask you know nine radiologists you know basically to do all this kind of manual evaluations, and we found that you know if AI this kind of AI technique with the manual reading if added together it can help you know physicians. For example, the sensitivity can improve. 20 percentage, and also the time can be significantly reduced. But this is just like you know the the the, the work. For example, we combine all this and then doing this kind of clinical application to help a physician. But in the meanwhile, actually we publish multiple paper uh, in the top journals, and also there is one on the review by by JAMA. So uh, I talk about. Uh, uh, full stack, uh, full spectrum, and other component. And then, in the next couple of uh, couple minutes, I will uh, quickly talk about the future develop development. But if, even for the future development, uh, it's very important uh, to do the you know, very close collaboration between company, uh, university, and other hospital. I will give you more examples like uh, brain related. So, so basically, we are doing like lifespan brain health from zero to eight. I will talk about zero to six project aging. Uh, uh, I, I, I may not talk about that, but I will also talk about uh, one ongoing major NSF project we are doing. So firstly, uh, for the early brain development, uh, when I was in US, I, I won out the co-PI co uh, leading for this zero to five, what we call the baby connectome project in US. So you will see, you know, if you work on the brain, actually, you know, the brain image in the first year for the baby develop very, very quickly, not only for the volume, but also for the intensities. I will show you some examples later. And, and we spent like 10, 10 years to do that, you know, from 2000. 2008 to, to 2018, we developed all this kind of pipeline. So this is also the reasons why we, we, we got a baby quantum project in US. And also in 2017, UNC published a paper in Nature. So you can see, for example, baby like six months, 24 months, the cortical area, this green one is a typical you know, subject. So the area actually is much smaller compared to the subject finally developed autism. So this is very important. For example, you know, if you're using the imaging, actually you can do the early diagnosis for the autism. And in, in China, actually, we continue doing this. Uh, it's a very large project uh, we, yeah, with uh, multiple million US dollar you know, support, support. So here, basically, we want to not only do this all the image analysis, we also to do, you know, like I mentioned, the full stake the full stake. We want to do the fast image acquisition and also motion collection, also develop an infant dedicated coil for that. So firstly, you know, the SS technique, as I mentioned, uh, we, we use it for the infant. We can reduce the scanning time like a 44 percentage. And of course, not the image will be same and also use it for the cortical sickness measurement. They are statically no difference. So, so this is for the fast image acquisition. And then uh, I just use 33 minutes. Okay. Uh, and also, you know, it, it's very important, for example, subject when you lie down in the scanner, uh, subject could move, particularly for the infant. Okay. So we put a camera over there. So this camera can actually, you know, record, you know, all the subject movement and we do the auto, you know, Automatic, uh, like uh, you know, motion tracking. Then use this information to adjust uh, the gradient in the MI. Means the gradient will basically follow this kind of motion. Okay. Otherwise, you have very you know fuzzy image acquired. With all this kind of technique, you can have very clear images. So, so this is also the you know what we use, and we even use the AI you know for reduce the noise in the MI image. And finally, you know, uh, we develop the coil. But because the baby, you know, brain is very small, the body is very small, we make this kind of infinite coil. Then you can see very clear uh, image acquired for the brain and also for the spine. So then you can do all this kind of analysis. So it, it, this is ongoing project, and uh, uh, we we are using this uh, 
uh, research scan we call the UMI A90. This is made by, 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 by our company, United Imaging. Uh, so this is a very high uh, or very advanced uh, MI imaging equipment in the basement of the uh, BME school, in my BME school in Shanghai Tech. And uh, because of very close collaborating with the United Imaging, so all the developer environment is the same as in the company. Means, you know, any, any sequence you develop, then you can immediately use, uh, you know, for the scanning. So in, the net, so in this totally five years, we, we will scan the, uh, about 1,000 subject. This is just uh, like a six months infant we are scanning there. All the subject will cover from zero to six years old. And, uh, you know, after each subject uh, scanned, we will automatically generate uh, like evaluation, you know, uh, report. You will, you will give, you know, all the, like, uh, for example, each part of the brain, let's say the hippocampus, okay? Then, where the hippocampus development for a particular subject is uh, similar as the same age of other subject. You can see, so this will give a lot of information. If uh, like a delayed development, uh, then you know you, you will have all the information included or uh, indicated in the in the report. So, so here is just uh, like you know I talk about from <coughs> zero to six. Uh, actually, we have another large or uh, major project uh, acquire the images from six to to eighteen using the same scan. So think about uh, some subject, sub for example, five years old, actually joins the first project, then become old, then join the second project. So in this way, we link actually zero to six, six to 18, like zero to 18 together. And also we have another large project actually study from 18 to, to, to 80. So this is the reason that we say lifespan brain healthy. We are doing this kind of research in Shanghai Tech BME school, uh, zero to eight years old. So uh, this is my final, final slides. So here, is, uh, as I mentioned, this is an ongoing project, a uh, major uh, NSF China project. So here, I just want to do everything, like from the imaging to diagnosis within minutes. So we know for early diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, it's important uh, you know, have the PET image because the PET can uh, basically provide you like, uh, of, of course, combined with other information, give you very related uh, AD information, for example, A beta information. But if you combine PET image with MI image, then you can do the early diagnosis for Alzheimer's disease. But for a lot of cases, just for health checking, it's impossible, you know, for, for you also to acquire the PET images. So in this way, you know, the questions become, Whether we just use the MI image, we can still do the early diagnosis. Of course, you know, we want to finish everything in the minute. So for the image acquisitions, we will use the ACS technique, uh, as I mentioned, uh, 99 seconds or less than, you know, uh, 100 seconds, you can acquire this structure image, diffusion image, and the functional images. Then, of course, you can do the diagnosis, but remember, you know, PET is very important. So, we are, you know, in this morning, you know, the uh, other speaker talk about AIGC. Actually, you know, uh, means you can generate the content. But this kind of technique is already used in, in our medical image area. For example, you can use uh, like a gang or other algorithm. Previously, when I was in, in UNC, you know, more than 10 years ago, we used uh, landing forest, you know, to do that. Okay, later on, we use some other machine learning, then deep learning, many, many methods. So basically, Using all the structural images or different images, you can estimate or generate a pet image very well. Using current technique, you can see, for example, this is the actual pet image you acquire for this subject. And this is the you know, predicted pet images using the MI image here. So they are very, very close. Of course, remember, these images, just like this one, is used to combine with the MI image to do the diagnosis, not try to use this one to replace the actual pet image. This part actually is, is very, very important. Yeah, so with all this, I think, you know, uh, we, can, we, can basically, we can basically finish, you know, the image acquisition, then doing this kind of image, you know, estimation from like MI image to pet image, integrate all information together using AI for doing early diagnosis. So 
in this way, like imaging to diagnosis, you can finish within minutes. So this is uh, like uh, uh, ongoing project. Uh, we just uh, you know spend one and a half year, another two and a half year to go. So this is uh, uh, basically all my talk uh, for for today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Shen. Um, we get some questions. Uh -huh. Just a few questions, any? Oh, very nice talk. I have some maybe half question and half suggestion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you show the uh, general segmentation model that is applicable to many, many, I mean, organ targets mm -hmm. over multiple imaging modalities. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see your research going, maybe adding like registration, other uh, regression tasks, and maybe, maybe call your model foundational model? Yeah, this is a very good question. So I, I did mention that, you know, uh, for a segment, uh, for example, the organs, uh, you know, like a whole body organ, 160, you know, organs. But, you know, previously, actually, we developed one AI for one, like, uh, you know, part of the organs imitations. But with, uh, like, a general AI technique or foundational AI, we, in, you know, in my company, actually, we are doing this. Uh, for example, you know, of course, you know, foundation model, like, it's very large. You try to do everything. But we say application of foundational model to the particular applications. For example, for the whole body organ labeling. You know, previously, you just say, okay, I segment airway from the CT images, and then I segment, you know, vessels in the liver. We do separately. But right now, you can do all this within one model. So the good thing is like, uh, you know, the vessels, where are they in, in lung or where are they in the liver, in the CT image or other modality, they are very similar. The ship are very similar. So they can help each other. And although actually the number of the samples can be increased. For example, for the liver, maybe you only have 200. But, you know, for lung, maybe you have, you know, 1,000, okay? Then other pattern may be just, uh, you know, like 100, okay? But if you want to develop a method to segment all the organs, then you can use all the sample together. And also, one important thing is the foundation model is the information you learn from one part of the body, you know, algorithm or AI technique can be used in the, in the other part. Like the relations here you learned, you can apply to the other part. So this is a good thing, like a foundation model. If we, you know, we say we like a vertical applications for foundation model, not like this model can, can do anything. The model just do the segmentation, you know, organ segmentation, target labeling for the body. And right now we are working on the, initially we work on the CT images. Actually, you know, we just spend one, one month, it, most you know organs. Or we, as, as I mentioned, uh, we develop you know in the in the past six years we develop forty AI techniques. But each one we spend one year or two year to do that. But right now, actually, you know, uh, over ten different applications using one foundational model. Within one month, we can reach very similar performance. So this is also the power of the foundation model, you know, to, to, to do that. But, you know, as I mentioned, we just use for the CT previously, right now also use the MI, and we think where the, you know, the organs in CT and in MI or other modality, they are similar in the high spatial, you know, dimension. Essential information is the same, although, you know, the, the, the information in the different modality looks like very different. So everything can be encoded, like multiple modality, multiple organ, you can integrate it with the one, one model to, to do that, yeah. Okay, um, thank you very much. In the interest mm -hmm. of time, mm -hmm. we move on, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you. So thank you very much again. Thank you. <clears throat>